Today, it is her purity that we are going to concern ourselves with. Her purity, and I talk about the church as a she, as a her, because that's how she's described in the Bible, as the bride of Christ. And just a, a brief recap, we looked at the, her order or the way she conducts herself last week. Uh, the, the church, the, there's a specific order or structure to the local church. And we looked at the um, duties or the certain uh, activities that she has or that she, she, um, she, yeah, that she has the previous week. And if you thought some of those things are neglected in our day and age amongst many um, local churches, especially evangelical ones, wait till you hear about her purity. And uh, really the thought is here about church discipline. Uh, this is perhaps one of the most neglected items, one of the most neglected marks of a true church. And so that there's many reasons why that's the case. Obviously, one of the reasons is because it's hard. It's hard to implement it. It's hard to, uh, to do it properly. And uh, it's easy to fall in, or I, I, in either direction of either not practicing it at all or practicing it in the wrong way. And so before we move on, let us read two passages, which will be, again, as a backdrop. This is very much still a topical message but they will be there as a backdrop uh, to what we are talking about here. So the first one, Ephesians 5, verses 25 through to 27. Ephesians 5. This has almost been a, a passage which is like a theme of the, of the whole series because it explicitly explicitly names... Uh, the reason for Christ coming into the world for his bride and for, his, for the church. And so it says here in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives. Paul is giving some practical teaching. And he says, Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might, and now pay attention to those verses, he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, not to the world, to himself, a glorious church. What does glorious mean? Not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and without blemish. So that is, that, if that was why he came into the world. He gave himself for the church and that he might present her in a certain way to himself. So, <clears throat> That is the first passage that I want us to keep in the back of our minds. And uh, lest you should think that this imagery of, uh, <clears throat> of, of the bride of Christ is only referring to the universal church, the invisible church, and all believers throughout all ages, let me assure you that even the local church can be described in those terms. And we see that in 2 Corinthians 11. And we'll, we can go there if you will. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11. I have betrothed you to one husband, says Paul, to the Corinthian church. <clears throat> that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, we, the apostles, have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, meaning not the Holy Spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. We'll stop reading there. And Paul, obviously in the context of the letter here, he's addressing those uh, super apostles, that's what they are called sometimes, uh, who had come into Corinth after his departure and they had basically persuaded the Corinthians that Paul was really not qualified to be an apostle. He was weak. He was uh, this and that and the other. And uh, so Paul actually 
is uh, quite jealous for them because he he says you're like my daughter. I I wanted to present present you as a chaste virgin to Christ on on that wedding day, and and it something tells me that that might not happen because you have you, you, well you have gone after some other another man so to speak. That that's the imagery here. The imagery here is that there's a danger, and uh, and Paul is obviously beside himself with with uh, a godly kind of jealousy uh, when it comes to the state of the Corinthian believers. So anyway, we'll leave it there. Those are just some background background passages that we want to keep in our minds as we as we think about this subject of the purity of the local church. <clears throat> So why is Christ so concerned with, with the purity of, of his bride? Obviously, the, the, you know, it goes without saying, as with any man, so with the perfect man, he is concerned with the purity of his blood-bought bride. Not just, just some random uh, you know, woman, so to speak, but uh, the blood-bought bride of Christ. He, she is described as his body. She represents him on the earth. Of course, he is to uh, be concerned about her purity. Can you imagine what goes through his mind, his feelings, his emotions? He does have those, by the way. Uh, when he sees that there is some corrupting influence that is, that is leading his very own blood-bought bride astray, can you imagine what that does to him? Can you imagine? Well, imagine what. Well, put yourself in the shoes of any husband like that. And now put yourself in the shoes of the perfect husband. Uh, and... and uh, you can start getting an idea of what this might be like. If he was eaten up, literally, that's the, that's the words used, by a godly zeal for that which was merely a picture of the temple, the, the earthly temple. Remember when he was down on earth here with us? He, he made a whip and he whipped out all the exchangers of money and all of that that was going on in the temple. Why? Because he was eaten up by a godly zeal for, for his father's glory. And the, the temple there, by the way, it, he himself said, a stone will not be left upon another in a few years' time. And now we know that's what happened just, just a few years after his ascension. The, the whole temple is destroyed. It's not, not there anymore. There's a mosque there. So think about it. If that was the zeal he had for that, which was merely a picture of the temple, what kind of zeal must he have when it comes to the real temple? And the real temple, by the way, is, yes, his body, which is the church, which is, by the way, that's, that's what it described, not just the church universal, but even, even local churches. That's what he, um, well, that's what Paul uh, tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Do you not know that you, the Corinthian church, are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now, in other places around in the New Testament, the believer's body is described as a temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells in it. And which is that that's equally true. But the local church is also described as a temple, uh, the temple of God, because the again, the Holy Spirit dwells in our midst. Christ is in our midst. And in the midst of any true local church so we often pray for that don't we we often pray that the lord would be in our presence uh, sorry the lord's presence would be in our midst and we would know it and it would be tangible and we think of always what that looks like in the positive sense we think oh imagine you know many people would be saved and this would happen and that would happen and we'll have a nice fuzzy feeling and but that's not uh, always what happens when when he is very close to his people. It is a scary thing. And that's why I, one of the hymns, I chose only two of them, but one of them was, uh, was this one. How sweet and awful is this place? Because it is, there is an awfulness to Christ's presence. And I hope you understand, I don't use awful in the modern sense, which is like something disgusting, but awful as in full of awe. Yeah? So, <clears throat> I mean, you think of, Revelation 2 and 3, Christ himself walking in the midst of the lampstands or candlesticks. And those, we are told, are churches, local churches. 
and he walks in the, their midst and he observes them. And when you read the letter that he writes to each one of them, you, you get the impression that he really pays attention to what's going on. He really knows what's going on. And he has some things to say about each and every one of those churches. He is not, <laughs> he's not without an opinion about it. <clears throat> he's concerned about their purity. And by the way, his presence there is described that when John saw him, even in that vision, he fell before him as dead. So Christ's presence in our midst is not, a, is not always this kind of thing that we can have like a very, uh, a, a very Disney-like uh, uh, imagination about, you know, it's not something that is always, so, something that is always uh, just positive. Well, it is always positive, but not always the, the, the same way that we think of it anyway. I mean, just think of Acts 5. Again, I, this passage, we've, we've talked about it last week, I think the week before. Acts 5, Ananias, Sapphira, that couple, they were part of the early church. They're in Jerusalem. What did they do? They lied. They, uh, they sold the field that they had. No one asked them to do it. They did it because they wanted to. They sold their own field. They gave, gave part of the money to the apostles, and they said that's the, that's the money for the field. And uh, it was a simple lie, but it was a lie not against man, but against God. It says, Ananias, Peter is talking, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost, to the Holy Spirit, and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? You have not lied to men, but to God. The Holy Spirit is God, says Peter, in a way. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And then just a few verses later, we read that great fear came upon all the church and all who heard these things once his wife said the same thing and she also died. Right there, drop dead. So what is that? Was that, oh, it, it escaped Christ's attention, the devil came in and killed him. No, that was Jesus doing that. That was his presence. That was the holiness of his presence where no sin can dwell. And that gives a holy fear into the church and beyond. And so we have to be very careful what we pray for. I mean, this is, those are some scary things and they should be. God's presence in the Bible is always accompanied by a holy fear. That's, with, that with, that's without exception. I just told you about John falling before the, the feet of the Lord Jesus as if he were dead. Jacob slept in a certain place with a, with a stone for a pillow. He saw that dream, that vision there in the night of, of, uh, of things that are spiritual of nature. And he said that the, the, he didn't know it, but this is the very house of God. God was here and I didn't know it. And um, Moses uh, at the burning bush, God calls him to it. He comes and observes that phenomena. He's interested in it. Nothing scary about it so, so far. And then when he realizes that he is in the presence of God, he, takes, he has to take his shoes off. And what does he do? He could not lift up his head to behold God. It goes on. Isaiah, in the presence of God, in that vision that he receives, Isaiah 6, what did he say? He says, woe is me. He pronounces an oracle of judgment upon himself because he realizes what a sinner he is in the presence of such a holy God. You go on and on and on. Throughout all of the Old Testament, New Testament, pres the presence of God is accompanied by fear. The presence of God is not something to be entered in lightly. And, uh, and that's why we want to we know what, what God is concerned about, what Christ is concerned about when it comes to his church. It is not a... Uh, it is not a flippant thing, and so we want to take it very seriously. You know, when the Holy Spirit was there in that early church, there were some great conversions. I mean, great conversions, thousands in a day. But there was also great sanctification of that early church, and it was, it was characterized by the fear of the Lord. And if we want to see some of that in our day, some of those conversions, some of those some of the movement of the Spirit like that, we ought to be prepared for both. We can't just assume that it's, it's going to be without 
you know, a cost. There is a cost to, to the Lord's presence. He will prune and he will do all that is necessary so that we can actually stand in his presence when he is here present and when he is saving in his presence like that. So this shouldn't surprise us because, because God, he loves his children. And, and if one thing is clear from, pay, from the start to the finish of the Bible is that love goes hand in hand with discipline. And that's how God does it. He loves us so much. He loves his children so much that he, he disciplines them. I mean, that's what he says even in, in Proverbs, does he not? And he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. God loves his children. And I hope you believe that. And if the Bible says in another place that if you are without discipline, that, that's actually evidence that you're not one of his children. He loves you so much if you're one of his children that he will make sure that he disciplines you and that you grow in holiness. That's what Hebrews 12 tells us that, well, he, he quotes again from the Old Testament, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when he rebukes, when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son that he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. And later on it says, he for our profit chasten us, chastens us, that we may be partakers of his holiness. He has said, I am holy, and therefore you ought to be holy. Be holy for I am holy, right? That's what he says. And, and he says that he now does that through his chastening rod for his children. Now, no chastening, it continues, seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceful, peaceable, sorry, fruit of righteousness to those, not to everyone, to those who have been trained by it, those who have learned their lesson, right? So that's, that's what he does. It, he does it for our profit. It's for our good that we might be partakers of his holiness. That is a good thing. <laughs> that is a good thing. That is a loving thing from our loving Heavenly Father. He does, you know, he does it also so that we are not condemned with the world. And maybe you, you haven't put the two together, but it, it actually says in 1 Corinthians 11, where it talks about church discipline, that kind of stuff, to some degree, it says, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord. He's talking about believers here. We're chastened by the Lord. That we may not be condemned with the world. It's either or. You're either disciplined by your Heavenly Father or you are condemned and judged by Him as your judge. There, there are no other options. You're either his son or you're his enemy. His sons get disciplined that they might be partakers of his holiness. His enemies, they get judged and condemned because he is righteous. And 1 Corinthians 11 goes on to say that some who have not self-examined themselves and, and uh, you know, God has disciplined them and, and he's chastising them. And he says, some of you are sick and some of you are even dead. Can you imagine? Can, that, can God do something like that? You better believe he can. Christian, he loves you so much that he won't let you perish. It's almost as if he says, I'd, I'd rather you die than go to hell. Those are solemn things to think about. But that's how much he loves you. He sent his son for you. He will make sure that his son's blood was not shed in vain. He will have you. He will see you there uh, in heaven. And he will make sure that there's nothing that stands in the way for you to get there. First Peter 4 says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God be? Can you imagine? Well, that's where the local church comes in. That's where the local church comes in. Because God delegates that part of that chastising process, part of that disciplining of his children to the local church. That, that's where... Uh, that's why we're talking about it in the first place. That's part of her purity. That's part of the, 
the, the w one of the ways in which she is to become purer and purer, more wrinkle-less, more blemishless, if you like, all, all those things that he came to do to her, to purify her, cleanse her. So he's delegated that responsibility so that he doesn't deal with it. And when local churches don't take that responsibility seriously, he actually has to deal with it. And you can see that in Revelation 2 and 3. You can see where he says, therefore, repent, otherwise I will come and I will wage war with them. I will do it. You, you, have, to, you have a responsibility to expel that which is an, a sinful influence from within your midst, he says to the church, as it were, that, that sin that you are tolerating, you have to get rid of it or else I will do it. And when, and when he says it that way, it's, it's not a, a positive thing. <laughs> you, you don't want to just sit there thinking, well, if he's got to do it, he might as well. You want to be thinking, he's delegated that responsibility to me, to me, to us, then therefore we ought to be serious about it. So, <clears throat> yeah. You, want, you wonder, hey, George, where, does that, where, where, where do you get that in the New Testament? How, how do you know that we are given that responsibility? Well, there's many, many passages as we'll look into all of them, but perhaps the first one that we come across is, is, is the one that uh, is often most misunderstood, and that's the Matthew 16 passage, just after Peter makes that wonderful confession of faith uh, of, of, uh, of his Lord Jesus, and he says uh, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the Lord tells him that flesh and blood has not revealed that to him, but uh, his Father, which is in heaven. And then he goes on to say that, uh, that he will build his, his uh, church upon this rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then he goes on to say, I also say to you that you are... Oh, sorry, I read that. And I will give you, he says, the keys of the kingdom, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And that is not contrary to popular belief, making Saint Peter, so to speak, a bouncer at the, you know, the pearly gates, where he's standing there with the keys and wondering if he should let you in or not. That's nothing to do with that. That's, that's a communication of the church's responsibility to do three things. Receive those who believe, Excommunicate great offenders who are unrepentant and restore those who are genuinely repentant amongst the offenders. And that's, that's how it works. That's how it works. It's as simple as that. Those, that, that is the keys. And I know that the, the Catholic tradition and other traditions like that like to uh, overemphasize those verses saying, oh, with, without the church, there's no salvation. There, there's, there's a saying that goes something along those lines. And we are here to say, oh, how dare you say such a thing? Salvation is found in the gospel. But if you think about it, if the local church does, and local churches are the ones who have the true gospel, yes, there is a way in which without the church there is no salvation. Without local churches, if there was no true believers in local churches like this one anywhere else around the world, there would be no salvation. He has given that task. He has delegated that responsibility. He, has, he doesn't say... How shall they uh, believe in, in whom they have not heard and how they, will they hear if there, there is no, no one sent? You know, he doesn't say, how will they hear? Well, of course, I'll, they'll hear because I'll tell them through an angelic uh, you know, visitation. No, he says, I'm going to send someone. How beautiful are, on the mountains are the feet of those who preach the gospel. That's how God you do, does it. He uses means. So Peter here is given keys. He's not given the sword, by, mind you, you know, the Lord Jesus told him, put your sword away. He tried to use the sword at one point. He said, put your sword away. And a few chapters later, or a few days later, after the resurrection, figuratively, not literally, he gave him a staff. He says, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. So the church is given the staff uh, that, that protects the sheep, that also disciplines them. But, uh, but, but the, the church is not given the sword. The sword is given to the state to punish the evildoers. So don't get the two confused. Those are two different things. And you know what? One thing that we want to understand before we continue, because otherwise this whole church discipline won't make any sense 
is that the New Testament speaks of a regenerate church. It speaks of a regenerate church. It speaks that all who are part of the church are born again. Not just simply professing faith, not just simply ones who are, uh, you know, happy to be part of the, this whole thing or are, are born in a Christian country, but ones who are truly regenerate. I mean, look at Ephesians 5. Christ gave himself for her. There's a, that, his very sacrifice was for her, for the church. He bought her. He, she is regenerate. The, the, our members are regenerate. And so, or Acts 2, what does it say there? Verse 47, towards the end, it says, The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So, you start messing with that, and uh, the conduct which is in the church will start looking like the conduct which is in the world. The church will, be, will look no different to the world. Because you look at churches where it's, it's a, a, gen, um, a, you know, a pass from one generation to another. It's, you know, they baptize their children because they are born in a Christian country. They think that's why they're Christians. That what, that's what makes them Christian. They think that that's how the, the church grows by r regional churches. You know, you're, you fall into the, the, uh, the location of the parish. Therefore, you're a Christian. Or you are born into a Christian home. That's why you're a Christian. That's not how it works, because that, if you bring in people like that into the church, sooner or later it will show. And uh, some of the men here, they read the book. Uh, we were going through it uh, with, uh, with Tim, um, the Reformers and their stepchildren. And uh, the guy who wrote the author, um, Leonard Bird Birdwin, Birdwin, I'm not sure, uh, he, he makes that observation. He says... Then Christian behavior and ordinary human behavior became indistinguishable. Conductual averagism was the immediate result of the Constantinian change. And now I know I don't, don't want to explain all of that, but basically he says when you make something, when you make changes like that, where all of a sudden the local church is not composed of true, genuine believers anymore only, but it becomes like a state church and everyone who's part of that country is part of the church. And we're all Christians now because we're born in a certain region of the world. That's when you look at the church and you look at the world and you see no difference. There's conductual average. The conduct of the world and of the church is, is the same. That's why the church's conduct is average. But that's not what we read in the Bible. In the Bible we read, you are not of the world. We read, be holy for I am holy. It, there's a difference. There ought to be a difference. Even, even in what we do. I mean, when the Lord says, you are the light of the world, we thought about that verse earlier, right? You are the light of the world. There ought to be something there to it. There, there ought to be some, some reality to that. Spiritually, morally, conductually, every way. It's not just, oh, I'm a, you know, I, I live like the devil, and I happen to be a Christian, and you live like the devil, you happen to be a Muslim, and that's, that's all. That's all there is to it. You know, you're just like brought up different, in different countries and in different ways and different religions. No. The Christians, out of all of other religions or so-called religions or, you know, whatever, ought to be different in their conduct, in the way they live. And that's why there, there is purity in the church, and there ought to be purity in the church, and that's why we're talking about it. <clears throat> so how is purity in the church measured, then, someone might ask. How is purity in the church to be measured? Well, the purity of a local church is to be determined by its proneness to tolerate unrepentant spiritual and moral sins in its members. It's proneness to tolerate unrepentant spiritual and moral sins amongst its members. And I'll give you two examples of that. I'll give you first an example of a doctrinal error, which we, we actually read that verse earlier, which the Corinthians were tolerating. 2 Corinthians 11, we read that. Paul is perplexed. He says, For if he, if he who comes to you, meaning those super apostles, preaches another Jesus, he preaches a different Jesus. Do you know that there are many cults out there who use the name of Jesus and they mean something completely different? They, they don't mean the same Jesus as the Bible. I mean, they, they, they say that he was created or that he was the half-brother of Lucifer or this or that or the other. It's, uh, it, they use the same name, but it's a different Jesus. So, so he goes on to say, For if someone preaches to you another Jesus, whom we have not preached to you, 
or if you receive a different spirit, and there are different spirits out there which masquerade out the Holy Spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. He says, you're so tolerant, you guys are. You're just so, you know, so gracious, you think you are. May God give us a holy intolerance towards a different Jesus, towards a different spirit, towards another gospel. That is not going to be unloving. That is going to be Christ-honoring. Let us not think that we can be more loving than God is. Uh, so that's an example. There is no purity in the, in the Corinthian church here because they are willing to tolerate that. They're willing to tolerate doctrinal error. There was no, in the Corinthian church, once again, where that's from the first epistle, there was no purity because they were willing to tolerate moral, gross moral sin in their midst. First Corinthians 5, verses 1 and 2. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. He says, your guys are worse than Gentiles in, the, in a way. He says, there, there are such things happening in, in your midst, and it not just happening. You are actually proud of it. You're actually happy. You're saying, whoa, look, we're, we've forgiven the guy. We're so, we're so gracious with the guy. He's still around. And it seems like that was their boast. And, uh, and, and it says that such sexual immorality that is not even named among Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. What? He says, you're puffed up. You have not rather mourned. That's, a, that's an occasion to mourn and weep over that kind of stuff that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. He says that would, be, that would have been the right thing to do. And you actually have done the opposite. You've done the opposite. That's why there's no purity in that church there in Corinth. They are, they are prone to tolerate unrepentant sin and false doctrine. That Christ is not impressed. Christ is not impressed with you, Corinthians, says Paul. So why is it important to deal with uh, sin in the church? Why, why is that such a big deal? I mean, surely if someone sins, that's their own problem. Well, not so. Uh, the Bible actually does say, and not that, that case with 1 Corinthians 5, that man, it, Paul continues and says, do you not know that a little, a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And he's talking here about people who make their own bread, which not many do today, but you... I know from uh, my wife who does sometimes and she puts leaven, she puts in to make sourdough bread and she puts leaven inside the dough and just a little leaven then causes the whole loaf, the whole uh, dough to be, well, to rise. It's a rising agent. It's alive. It's bacteria. And in speaking of bread, it's a positive thing. I like it. But speaking of sin, it's a negative thing, right? It spreads. That's not the point that it spreads. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little sin in the church makes the whole church like it. it. It affects the church. It makes it, it spreads, it corrupts, it infects. That's the, that's the point. That's why you don't tolerate it. It, it spreads not just, well, in this case it's leaven. In another place he's, he likens it to gangrene. You know, the infection. 2 Timothy 2.17, he talks there about, well, false doctrine again. He says, avoid irreverent, irreverent babble. For it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. And their talk will spread. Their talk will spread like gangrene or cancer if you have a NKJV. So if you have, and I, I knew a person who had an infection that later turned into gangrene, and uh, later they had to have their leg amputated, and later they died. So, um, what, what do you do usually? Well, you usually address the issue. You, uh, you treat the problem. That's what he says. You don't just leave it there. If you leave it there, you're going to die. If you don't, deal with it. So, you know, just physically speaking, gangrene. You want to treat this thing as soon as possible, as quick as possible, as effectively as possible. Otherwise, it will spread. Otherwise, it will corrupt the rest of the body, even the healthy parts of it. 
And if you don't do that, well, amputation might fall. And if you don't amputate, well, death might fall. It's, it's, it's that serious. It's not something to be taken lightly. And sin is likened to leaven, to gangrene, that kind of thing in the church. And it has to be dealt with. And uh, you want to, if it's early stages, you want to treat it in a way that will, that will be appropriate. And, but if it's, if it's spread, if it's already started to decompose, uh, then you want to amputate. And that's, that's literally removing a member, right? So sin in the church is like that. It's like a fly in the ointment. Fly in the ointment, which the ointment which was meant to be a sweet smelling savor of Christ, this testimony of the local church in the world, because of a fly in the ointment, it has it, it's begun, begun to stink like the world. No different to the world. The world sees from a diff- distance and says, look at what things are happening in that church. They, they talk about God all day long and then look at this guy. They, he's, he's right there with them. The guy who has his father's wife, he's right there with them. They have no problem with that. Isn't that interesting? Oh, they're, they're worse than us. That's what the world says about Christ, about his bride. When we tolerate Things like that. May it never be. Well, the reason we want to deal with, uh, with uh, <clears throat> we're concerned about the purity in the church and we want to deal with, with sin in the church is because also, as we said already, Christ walks among the lamps, lampstands, about, among those candlesticks. He walks among them and he is, do you know what he says to the Ephesian church? He says that if they don't repent, he will remove their lampstand. He will remove their lampstand. You know, their testimony has been dimmed by sin. And he says that lampstand is good for nothing anymore. It doesn't give light. You know that uh, a church which is tolerating sin like that and doesn't shine anymore is, is a far greater offense to Christ than a thousand mosques are? It, it is... It, it, the mosque, the, you know, the Muslim guys, they don't name, I mean, yes, they say that Jesus was a prophet, that kind of thing, but they don't claim that he is their savior or that he is the bride of the church, uh, sorry, the bridegroom of the church. But we do, churches do, you know, Christians do, and therefore that is a far greater offense to him than simply uh, some other sinner out there. Better without a lampstand, he says, almost, than a dark lampstand, a lampstand that doesn't work. See, a, a, an impure church is not neutral like that. It's, it's, it's worse. It's worse than, than no church. Hey, don't you remember what happened in the Old Testament in uh, Joshua 7? Achan, this guy who, who took part of the spoil from the battle of Jericho and hid it, even though God's explicit command was not to do that. And brought, God brought a defeat upon the whole camp because of him, even though no one knew about it. So don't think that some sin in your life doesn't have an effect upon the whole congregation in one way or another. This is serious business. So I'm going to end with a few principles of church, of biblical, hopefully, church discipline. So number one, preventing is better and easier than correcting. Preventing, better than correcting. So uh, it's like, it's like health-wise, it's better to boost your immune system, right? Whilst you're healthy through healthy living and good food, it's better to boost your immune system than to actually stuff yourself with medicine once you're sick. It, you get the point. So you're in the first case, you're preventing something from happening. In the second case, you're dealing with, with what has already happened. In the broadest sense, I say this because in the broadest sense, church discipline involves pretty much everything that we do in the church. It can be both the instructive, the positive nature of of things in the church and the corrective, negative, you know, when you rebuke or disassociate, excommunicate someone. Those are the negative, corrective measures, but there is also a ton of positive, uh, instructive measures that can be taken so that we don't end up in the corrective section. So... Church discipline, think about it that way. Don't always think of it as, well, when it happens, we'll do something about it. No, do something about it now, both in you and in others, 
so that it doesn't get there. So in examples of instructive or preventative discipline are, well, basically what we, what we discussed two weeks ago, all the activities of the church. You know, the, the preaching and teaching, the fellowship and the conversations that you have with one another, the uh, regular participation in the Lord's, uh, at the Lord's table where you are supposed to examine yourself and uh, all those uh, different ways through the prayers of, of different believers, through the singing. You know, we, ad we are well, admonishing one another through the singing. And especially if we are singing good, s spiritually sound hymns, they, are, they encourage you to, they stir you on, they kind of, uh, you, you kind of uh, are invigorated by them to run better, to run uh, stronger, uh, to keep going, to not give up, to not give in. And that's, uh, that's the, the whole point of it. You know, those, all those encouragements uh, are meant to be preventative, almost, um, discipline. In the local church is the place where Christians ought to encourage one another to love and good works, right? And they are to encourage one another in their pursuit of holiness, in their mortification of sin. We, that's where we encourage one another for all those endeavors. Hebrews 3 says this, verse 12 and 13, Beware, he says, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. How do we beware? How, do we, how are we to be on our guard against that? He says, but exhort one another daily while it is still called today. While there, if it's another day, by God's grace, exhort one another. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful. And uh, you, you um, separate yourself from the, from the church body for a while, from the influences of the church body, from the mutual exhortation within the church body, and sin will be there what Carlos was saying, it's at the door. It's trying to deceive you. It's trying to persuade you. This is okay. Look at everyone else. They're doing it and, uh, and they're happy and everyone's... Those guys there in that church, they're big. They're wacko. You know, they're a bit crazy. No one goes as far as that. I mean, Christianity is great, but don't, don't be radical like them. I mean, just be, be just more balanced. The deceitfulness of sin, and uh, and we are to exhort one another daily to avoid sin's deceptions. So when we hear them, that we we say, "Get behind me, Satan!" <laughs> None of that. I don't believe that. I believe that I am to mortify sin. I believe that I am to grow in holiness. I believe that the Lord shed His blood. That He is that He wants a pure bride, a cleansed bride. So when we do that preventatively, it can be a totally positive experience. Uh, you know, keep on running. You know, just keep, keep going. Don't give up. This, this thing in your life, you know, deal with it and move on. Pursue Christ. Pursue holiness. Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Seek Him and you will find Him. Knock at the door and He'll open it for you. That, that's positive. That's positive church discipline. That's when you are encouraging one another. And so even if someone was a little shaky and wavering perhaps, almost about to slip and fall, a brother comes along and he shakes him up and he says, keep going, keep going. And, and he, he get, gets the, the encouragement and the, the energy that he needs and then he actually is more careful in his walk then. And he never slipped and fell. Or even if he did, he didn't go all the way down. So, this happens also through the preaching, especially, you know, through a balanced diet of, of the whole counsel of God. And don't assume that simply because I'm saying that, that's what that's happening here. Pray for it. Because that ought to be happening. That's my desire. But pray for it. You know, I uh, did a course in lifeguarding when I was younger, maybe around 17. And uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the coach there, the lifeguard who was training us, he gave us this example, and I've never forgotten it. He gave us two, 
two lifeguard scenarios. He says one guy, he had a very quiet day. He didn't take get anyone out of the water uh, on this uh, on his post, right? Uh, and um, and he uh, he didn't go into the water. He didn't rescue anyone. Just 50 meters down the beach, the other lifeguard he rescued 20 people out of the water from drowning. Who's the better lifeguard? I mean, they had the same sea. You know, the same sea was the same waves were at them. Who was the better lifeguard? And now all of us said, well, it's the, the, the second guy. He rescued 20 people. That's that, that's some, some that's a good effort. But he said, no, it's the first guy. It's because the first guy never let them in the water to the the extent where they would essentially be in danger of drowning. He 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 was a lot more careful to begin with. And so anyway, that stuck with me. And it's similar with the local church. Be there for your brethren so that you don't have to rescue them from drowning in their sin. So then that's the first principle. The second principle, <clears throat> the, degrees, the degrees of corrective discipline should correspond to the severity of the offense and the repentance it produces. So those are correlated. There's a correlation there. And then we read of, uh, first of all, of things which are more mild. Now that we're talking about corrective discipline now, we're not talking about uh, the, the positive. We're talking about the negative. We're talking about where it actually has to be uh, corrected. So there's a more gentle uh, side to those, and uh, there, there can be just a rebuke or a warning. Galatians 6 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken or caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. So here's here's uh, how uh, how he you know how this is dealt with. This is simply through a uh, correction, a rebuke, a warning. Maybe it's a gentle rebuke. Maybe it's a stern warning. But but that's as far as it goes. You restore such a one. James five twenty says. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and, his, and he will cover a multitude of sins. If as, as you're, you're walking behind a brother and, and you see him veer off the straight and narrow, and, uh, and by the way, the straight and narrow is always flat, the, or, you know, if you, if you like, Everything off that road is, is, on, is a slope. And, and slipping on it, you don't just stay there. You go, you go further and further and further down that cliff until you fall off it. <clears throat> and so James here is saying, if you see your brother basically about to slip or even starting to slip and going down that hill, quickly grab him and bring him back on track. Because by doing so, you're not simply, simply saving his soul. You are also sparing him from a multitude of other sins. Sin always leads to more sin, doesn't it? It's never static. It never says, okay, that's enough. Go back to Jesus now. No, sin goes to goes further and further and further into sin. And it always excuses it and justifies it and then even glories in it. It, it defends it and, uh, and boasts in it. That's how it works. It's a gradual thing. Then, apart from the rebuke and warning, you know, we go to the next, we crank it up, if you like, we go to the next level, temporary withdrawal from fellowship. And then that's uh, what, we, what we see described in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly or in idleness. In the context there is someone uh, of the Corinthian church, uh, sorry, of the Thessalonian church doesn't want to work. They're idle, they're busybodies, and they uh, just mess in other people's business. They are not interested in, in working. They're lazy. And in 1 Thessalonians, he says, warn the idle. But in 2 Thessalonians, obviously, after the warning comes the temporary withdrawal from fellowship. And that's not a permanent thing. That's simply so that they are ashamed and then they are to be admonished as brothers, not, not treated as enemies. And so this is another uh, form of, of uh, uh, church discipline in a corrective church discipline, a higher degree. And then finally, you have the, the permanent disassociation or excommunication. And that can be for anything like divisiveness. Romans 16, 17 says, Now I urge you, brethren, 
Note those who are causing divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. Titus 3.10 says, reject or shun a divisive man after first and second admonition. So you've warned him once or twice and he continues to be divisive and he causes damage to the body. And uh, he said, avoid such a person, reject such a person. Or as we read in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, when it comes to some kind of gross immorality, which is not repented of. It, it says, uh, Paul talks about uh, this man and he says, for indeed I, indeed absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged this man as, as though I was there present with you. And um, he says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you, when you are gathered together, this is a church ordeal. This is not something that Paul has the right as an apostle to say. He, he actually says, this is your job, uh, church. When you're gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, and now the words that are very, very strange to our ears, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Wow. And then he goes even further to say that I'm not right. He says, I'm not telling you to disassociate yourself from people who are immoral or, or, or the likes. Uh, if, if that was the case, then you have to literally get on a rocket and go to the moon. You know, you, get, or you, you, you end up in a monastery. That's, that's not what you're to do. You, you're not to disassociate from people who are immoral out in the world. That's, they can't help it. But people who say that they are Christians and are immoral like that, now, that's, that's a problem because they are, they are uh, essentially being a, a blot on uh, the, the testimony of Christ. They say that Christ has power to save, yet they, they deny the power of Christ in their own lives. So he says, I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or uh, is an idolater, a reviler or slanderer, a drunkard, or swindler, that means a fraudster, someone who cheats others, not even to eat with such a one, he says. So those are some, some degrees of corrective church discipline that we read of in scripture, and I am sure you can break them down further. Third principle, keep any kind of discipline as local as possible. And this is not so that we cover it up. No, no, no. This is because when someone repents of it, it doesn't have to go any further. It's not just something that we will write on the news and, and put it in the newspaper of GFM. Oh, this person sinned. Let's all, you know, glory in how sinful they are. No, that's not the point. Now, I mean, first, uh, sorry, Matthew 18 gives us the principle of, of this, the church trial. Someone, a brother sins against you, go to the brother personally, privately, speak to him, brother, this and this happened. If he, if he hears you, if he ha repents because of what you've uh, uh, brought to him, and if that, the charges are real, you've won your brother. It, it goes no further. That's the end. Praise the Lord. Well, if he doesn't listen to you, or you think you're biased or something, then bring two or three other witnesses. So, okay, I didn't, uh, sorry, bring one or two uh, other people with you who, who would basically affirm what you're saying, uh, also, it's wise that those other people are people that he, you know, he, he trusts as authorities in, the, in his life, not just people that he thinks are your buddies and will say whatever you say. And, uh, and, and then w when the truth is confirmed by two or three witnesses in his ears, now, now maybe now he'll hear you and maybe now he'll repent. And now you have won your brother. And again, this goes no further. The church has no idea about what happened and so it should be. But... If he doesn't listen to them, then the matter is to be presented to the church. And that's not so that everyone just stays there and, you know, nods their heads in disapproval and, uh, and just uh, stares down at the man or the woman and, and shames them. No, that's because the whole point is that people in the church then have, a, have some kind of a time frame when they can go and speak to the person. So, so that's what, what he heard from two or three witnesses. Now he hears from the entire body. And now, hopefully, he will or she will repent. But if that doesn't happen, then the Lord says, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. And to the Jewish mind, that's basically have nothing to do with them. You, you, they wouldn't eat with tax collectors. Do you remember? They, they, 
accused Jesus of eating with sinners and tax collectors. So the point is that you have to treat the person who's done that the same way and, and avoid them if, if, if they are unrepentant, even when this is brought to the church and the whole church in one voice uh, shares their concern with, with the brother or the sister. Well, some, some cases, like the case in 1 Corinthians 5, are so gross or so public anyway that they skip that trial. You know, there, there's no point in that trial. There's, it's already been out there. Everyone knows about it. Something ought to be done about it straight away. Uh, Titus uh, 1.9 also uh, uh, it says that elders ought to rebuke people who are publicly contradicting good doctrine. And he says you're publicly to, co- you're publicly to rebuke them. He must, <coughs> the, the, the elder must uh, hold firm the truth, truth, trustworthy, sorry, word of word as taught so that he may be able, the positive, to give instruction in sound doctrine and the negative also to rebuke those who contradict it. So that's a public thing. Then elders themselves ought to be rebuked when they have sinned because they have a public office. And uh, so when the accusations are received against an elder two by two or three independent witnesses, then Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, those who are sinning, rebuke, that's in the context of elders, rebuke them in the presence of all, that, that, that the rest also may fear, that they might know that there's consequences to sin. Fourthly, and I'll just move through those um, quicker. Fourth principle, church discipline is not just the job of the elders. That's a big thing. I want you to know this. This is not something that church elders ought to be doing and you are just sitting back and relaxing, doing nothing. Now, it's all those previous, uh, um, bo- both positive examples and negative examples, both uh, instructive and corrective, are to do with the whole church. Everyone is involved. First Corinthians 5, when you gather together. Galatians 6, you who are spiritual. So you see how it, it involves other people. It doesn't involve only the elders. Maybe the elders, yes, they have to take the lead. But if, you know, if someone here sins against someone else, and that someone else goes and, and deals with the, the first brother, and, and they, they sort things out among themselves, and no one tells me, I would be the happiest person, because that, that's how it should be. It doesn't have to go through me. It, you, can, you can resolve it on the local level, on the most local level possible. And so that, when a church does that, that's beautiful. Then it never becomes, it never escalates, never becomes a big thing. You know, and that's all the warn, withdraw from, avoid. It's all to do with the whole church. It's not, and there's no point whatsoever for the elders of a church to say, okay, we're now going to avoid that person because of this sin, which is he's unrepentant of. And then the whole church absolutely disregards that and just continues fellowshipping with that person as if nothing happened, right? So that, that, that's just, uh, that's a contradiction. That gives the person mixed signals. That affirms them in their sin. That tells them something's wrong with all those elders. And, and maybe, maybe, obviously, before the decision is made, that ought to be discussed, of course, when a, a measure like that is to be taken. And so that everyone is united, is on board. Uh, and uh, there's, or at least the majority are, so that there's no disunity in the church over matters like that. Because this unity in correction is, is worse than no correction. You know, that you, those of you who are parents ought to know that from their own children. You want to be united. M- mom and dad want to be united when they, when they set rules and boundaries to their children, when they discipline, when they... Otherwise, dad's good, mom's bad, or mom's bad, dad's good, or, or whatever, the other way around. So uh, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The child quickly finds out that one is more lenient than the other, one gives more liberties than the other, and they will, they suss this out very quickly. And it, it, it doesn't help the discipline. It doesn't help it at all. Fifth point, fifth principle of church discipline. Dis- <coughs> discipline is to be carried out with the hopes of repentance and restoration. With the hopes of repentance and restoration. It's not just done for the sake of it. Every form of discipline is done a, for the good of the congregation, for the ch- good of the church. Uh, notice verses 6 and 7 in 1 Corinthians 5 says, A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. So that's going to be good for you if you purge out the old leaven. So that's the good of the church. But also for the good of the person who is in sin, in unrepentant sin. 
The goal is to produce in that person godly sorrow, which leads to repentance, which leads to restoration. And uh, that's why Paul says here in, uh, again, 1 Corinthians 5, about this guy uh, who sinned without a gross immoral sin, deliver such a one to Satan. Why? For the destruction of his flesh. Why? That his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He says it is far better for something to happen to him outside of the protective care. And I hope you understand that the church offers a, a protective hedge uh, uh, spiritually through everything that happens in the church, through the prayers of the saints, through the, the way we deal with one another, through the way we challenge one another, through the way we rebuke one another and exhort one another and admonish one another. All of that offers a protective shield, if you like, uh, within the local church. And so, you know, when you when you excommunicate someone and that they or that person just leaves for, for whatever reason, they exit that protective care of the church and so they are they they are under Satan's attacks in a way that they weren't before, and and uh, and Paul says that actually that's better in a way, because even though even though something might happen to their body or something might happen to you know them physically, at least that can bring them back to repentance and they can be saved. You know, Paul says, don't be unloving. Do you want the unrepentant sinner to be in the church all the days of his life and then go to hell? Is it not better for you to exclude him from fellowship so that he might come to his senses and repent and then be saved? Isn't that a far better thing? In the, uh, the restoration of the... Uh, there, there, in 2 Corinthians, there is a restoration of an offender. Now, we're not told whether it's the same guy from 1 Corinthians. Some people say that he is. But even if it isn't, look at the beauty of it. He says, the punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. Now that's, that's you know, reception back. That's, that's restitution, restoration, uh, where the person is brought back. But notice, there was sorrow there. You know, he's, he, now Paul is concerned, lest there be too much sorrow. But now, but there is sorrow. It's not just like, ah, whatever. You know, they decided to excommunicate me, whatever. I don't care. That's not sorrow. It, it, this, the, this church discipline uh, affair here, it actually produced godly sorrow. It actually produced repentance. Beware also, a part of that point, of repentant less restorations. Absalom, you know, David's son, he was essentially exiled because of something he had done, because of a you know, murder that, that he was guilty of from the kingdom. And then later Joab, the, the king, one of the king's mighty men, he, you know, in, instigated the whole thing so that, they, so that he, Absalom is brought back into the kingdom repentantless and the second time he came he caused way more damage than the first time there was no repentance in him so beware of that repentance and restoration however just know, know, know this they do not cancel out the the consequence of sin so you know Adam ate the forbidden fruit right and he lost the garden Moses lost his temper and he lost also the privilege of bringing the Israelites into the promised land. Samson disclosed the secrets of his strength and he lost his eyes. Saul disobeyed God's command and he lost the throne. Uh, you, there are so many other examples. David numbered the people in pride and then he lost 70,000 men. All of those people were repentant in one way or another for what they had done. Their repentance didn't cancel out the effects of their sin. So also mind that. Because this is an important thing. There are sins that, th there's no sin that cannot be repented of. But there are sins that can disqualify in a way that you cannot then be restored. For Forgiveness is one thing. Forgiveness is one thing. Uh, that, that Christians are commanded to forgive all those who have sinned against them. Especially when they are, uh, when they are repentant. When they come to them and say, oh, forgive me. Right? How many times? 70 times 7. 
okay, but that doesn't mean that we we can just trust them again like like before, right? Trust is something that has to be uh, developed and something that has to be won back, something that has to be proved. And so, yeah, that that's another another thing you want to watch out for. Finally, have my final point. Uh, 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 from those principles of church discipline is love, not legalism, must propel any church discipline. We need to know what is important scripturally and what isn't so important so that we know how to address a certain matter. If we are, if we become such, uh, you know, just hair splitters, that we start church disciplining everyone who disagrees with us or anyone who might be in the smallest error or wrong, we will become a den of legalists. This will not be grace fellowship. It will be legalistic den. And that's not what we want to be. That's not what we want to be. That's why Peter, he says this, Above all things, have fervent love for one another. Have fervent love for one another. Why? Because love will cover a multitude of sins. And he's probably quoting Proverbs 10 there. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. And that's the point, that love can not overlook things which are going to be damaging to the whole body, but things which are more minor, things which can be sorted out with a, just a, a comment, with uh, going out and uh, getting a coffee and talking about something or whatever, right? So that's what love does. Love looks for ways to deal with things without being unnecessarily harsh with people. Brethren, this is not meant to be a step-by-step -step guide to church discipline or anything like that. I just wanted to show you that throughout the whole of the New Testament, Christ is concerned with the purity of his blood-bought bride. As we speak, as we are having this meeting right now, he is in the business of sanctifying her, cleansing her, washing her by the word. <coughs> Sorry. In order that he, he might present her a glorious church, holy, without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. That's why discipline does matter in a local church. It does matter. And uh, however, we're not going to practice it just for the sake of it. Oh, we haven't disciplined anyone. Let's go for it. Let's let be a healthy church and let's just find someone to discipline. No, we're not on a witch hunt, so to speak. And uh, we want to be, you know, we want to be extra careful. We want to be, uh, we want to, we want, don't want to shy away from it, but let us exhort one another. It's far better to not get there, isn't it? Yes. So what's your responsibility? What's your responsibility? Real quick. You and I, all of us, uh, members of, of, of the church, have a responsibility to keep the church pure. And that oftentimes begins not by looking around, okay, let me see who's here, but I, by, actually by looking in the mirror, all right? Looking at yourself. There's no point in finding a speck there in your brother's or sister's eye, a small splinter, when there's a four by two timber in your eye that's blocking anything from, from obstructing your sight, from look, seeing anything clearly. There's a, there's a proper log in your eyes and you can't, you can't see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. So, of course, begin with self-examination. That's the first thing. That's the, that's the base, most basic thing. And after you have dealt with everything that you can see in yourself, that doesn't mean that that's everything that you, that, that's wrong with you. That's only the things that you have seen in yourself. Now, grow some thick skin and be prepared for others to show you some other things, maybe, that need to be addressed. So don't be uh, one of those pe people who are offended by the, the slightest uh, suggestion that there might be something that you need to, uh, you need to uh, have a look at. And in the bond of love, if, uh, if necessary, with patience and gentleness, address then issues in others scripturally. Make sure you have a reason for what, doing what you're doing from the Bible. From the Bible. Not, not just because that's your tradition, that's how you're brought up, that's uh, the, the background you were accustomed with or whatever, from the scripture. 
Don't do it behind someone's back. They do it, do it directly with him. Keep it as private, as local as possible. And they address it in the most local level as possible. And if it does come to a, a more, a, a, a more, a, a greater level of, of cor corrective disciplinary action, the most <clears throat> loving thing to do, the most loving thing you can do is to actually be on board and not have misplaced sympathy with the unrepentant offender. That won't help him. It won't help the church body. Be on board, understand the issue, understand the problem, and understand that that is the most loving thing you can do for someone who is falling in an offense like that. And that is, some, 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 that is your responsibility when it comes to the glory of Christ, which is the church. You want to make sure that you put him first before all. Brethren, I know those are hard things to hear and those are hard things to think about and they are not, you know, pleasant, but, but they're, they are glorious as well because that tells us Christ is concerned about his bride. He is not going to just let her get, um, you know, abused and all of that. He is going to protect her. He is going to keep her. He is going to sanctify and cleanse her and present her, her to himself a glorious bride. And that is something that we ought to look forward to because if you are part of that bride that that includes you that includes you and if you're not part of that bride today is the day of salvation for you you can be saved father help us in those matters father we long we long with all our hearts to be able to prevent things from happening if possible we, we know that you have given us means of grace. You have given us so many ways in which to instruct one another, exhort one another. Lord, we want to use and take full advantage of all, those, of all those means and not be passive, be active and proactive in everything, in every way so that we can, we can save each other, literally, that we can spare one another from, har from harm, spare one another from sin and, and all uh, the destructive forces of, of sin. Oh, Father... Give us a mind, give us a heart that puts you first, however, in all things and all wants to honor you and help us to be scriptural in all things that we do. We need your help. We need your spirit. And we do pray for your presence, even if that is a scary thing. Father, we do pray that uh, the fear of the Lord will be upon us. In Jesus' name, amen.